This is part of a series of three videos on resilient modulus testing. This video outlines the process of starting a laboratory testing program and includes a detailed definition of resilient modulus. The other two videos are a discussion of whether now is the time to get into resilient modulus testing and an overview of resilient modulus sample preparation and testing. Before we get into the details of the startup process, it's important to explain what resilient modulus is. What you're watching now is part of that explanation. Obviously, it's an animation, but it does suggest what really happens when heavy vehicles use a pavement. Each axle briefly loads all of the materials under it. Then, as the vehicle moves, loading is transferred to other areas. Stress is the technical term we use to refer to load divided by area. As a result of the stress, the material exhibits the characteristic called strain. That just means it becomes distorted. And then rebounds. As shown with our subgrade cylinder here, the material is distorted in all directions, all at the same time, over and over again. Each time the stress is removed, the material tends to return to its original shape. Tends to return, I said. That's important. We want the pavement material to spring back to its original shape, because if it doesn't, we've got trouble in the form of rutting, cracking, potholes, or other expensive problems. With this situation, pavement designers need a test that will tell them how springy the subgrade material is under stress. To get this information, we bring a sample to the laboratory and subject it to a simulation of the stresses caused by vehicle. We stress the sample over and over again at various pressures, so we know how it will respond to a variety of vehicle sizes and at various depths in the pavement structure. We're interested not only in how much it deforms under a known load, but in how far it springs back, because the material never comes all the way back to its original shape. So we measure how far it comes back. That's called the recoverable strain. By the way, to illustrate these ideas, we're exaggerating the deformation a lot. If we divide the change in stress, which is also called deviator stress, by the resulting recoverable strain, we get a ratio of stress to strain. The name of this ratio is resilient modulus. Resilient modulus is a way of characterizing the stiffness of a material. When pavement designers know the subgrade's resilient modulus, they plug it into a model and come up with the thickness of the materials that will need to be put on top of the subgrade. If the subgrade has a low resilient modulus, in other words, it's not very stiff, the engineers will want a thicker layer on top to spread out the load so less stress is transferred to the subgrade. The goal is to specify the most cost-effective combination of materials to carry the loads expected on the pavement. So resilient modulus is a key piece of information about materials that engineers use in designing pavement. And your lab is about to begin resilient modulus testing so you can supply that information. But getting into resilient modulus testing isn't just a matter of buying some equipment and flipping the switch. You'll need to do some tweaking and problem solving to get your system up and running. Since we can't predict which problems you'll be solving, we're not going to try to cover everything you might encounter here. But we will give you an overview of what lies ahead, a walkthrough of the resilient modulus startup process. One thing you need is this, the Federal Highway Administration's publication number RD96176, called Resilient Modulus of Unbound Materials, Laboratory Startup and Quality Control Procedure. RD96176 was developed as part of the long-term pavement performance program. As the name implies, RD96176 tells you how to verify that your system is working right, and it says that after you're up and running, you should use the startup protocols as the basis for an ongoing quality control program. That's important because you don't want to spend even one day gathering bad data due to out-of-spec or malfunctioning equipment. In addition to the information in RD96176, you'll also want to take advantage of the training offered by the manufacturers of your equipment. And speaking of equipment, in a nutshell, here are the main parts of a resilient modulus test setup. 
a triaxial pressure chamber equipped to use air to confine the test sample, a servo hydraulic system that includes a load frame, an actuator, a servo valve, and accumulators, a load cell to measure loading on the sample, linear variable differential transducers, or LVDTs, which measure a test sample's changes in height. By the way, there's another LVDT hidden inside the servo hydraulic actuator. Signal conditioners that are the interfaces between the transducers, the load cell and LVDTs, and the computer controller. In some setups, the computer and controller are separate, and in others, they're integrated. Either way, the job is to generate and control the command waveform sent to the servo hydraulic system, and at the same time to receive and store the feedback from the transducers. Finally, you need a variety of equipment for preparing test samples, and of course, you need enough space in your lab to do the work efficiently and safely. RD96176 states that there are three main parts to the startup verification process. First, you verify that your electronic system works right. Next, you verify the calibration of the most important mechanical components and verify the function of the entire system. And last but not least, you verify the proficiency of technicians in preparing test specimens and running resilient modulus tests. We'll go through each of these areas in more detail. First, the electronics. There's an input side and an output side. On the input side, you key in a reference signal, shown here in red, that you want the system to run on a sample, and the controller sends that information to the servo hydraulic system, which creates the load cycles you keyed in. On the output side, you're dealing with signals coming back from your load cell and LVDTs. Each of these transducers sends a signal to a signal conditioner, which converts the signal and sends it to the computer, where the signal is digitized, displayed, printed, and stored. Okay, so that's a typical resilient modulus electronic setup. There are two things about the electronics that you need to verify during the startup procedure. First, you need to check the phase angle, in other words, the time delay between the inputs to the signal conditioner and the outputs from the signal conditioner to the computer. You'll use a function generator to simulate the output signal of the LVDTs and load cell. And you'll view the phase shift between the input and output for each channel on both an oscilloscope and on your computer. The second thing you need to find out is how much difference there is between the amplitudes of the signals going into the signal conditioner and the signals coming out of the signal conditioner. As I said earlier, you're likely to run into problems during the resilient modulus startup process. Some of the most common problems encountered with the electronic system are load cells that have been subjected to loads above their intended range, unmatched filters, and amplitude roll-off from two to 50 hertz. Typical software problems include inadequate load control, inadequate sampling rates, and saving the command values rather than the output values. After you verify that your electronic gear is working right, you go on to the second major part of the startup process, where you check the calibration of your transducers, the LVDTs, and the load cell, and then verify that the overall system is performing up to spec. Again, we won't list the detailed requirements here. They're in RD96176. What we will do is briefly describe the test you'll run and some problems you may need to solve along the way. First, the LVDTs. You need to check each one for accuracy with an LVDT calibrator at at least eight points in the LVDT's range. For the load cell, first you use a strain indicator to check the zero reading. A zero reading above one and a half percent of full scale probably means the load cell is damaged and should go back to the manufacturer for evaluation. Next, you need to verify that the load cell is correctly calibrated in all load ranges required for FHWA resilient modulus testing. For that, you'll need proving rings calibrated to a load cell that's traceable to a National Institute of Standards and Technology load cell. 
Complete specifications on the verification process are in RD-96-176. You'll do both static and dynamic tests to verify the load cell calibration. In the static test, you verify that the load cell's output matches the deformation of the proving rings within specified limits. In the dynamic test, you check the load cell against four criteria. The waveform generated by the load cell must be close to the ideal input, a Haversine wave. The deformation output must be reasonable. The mean deformation values must be similar to the applied load. And the readings from the proving ring and the load cell must correlate better than 99%. Finally, you evaluate the overall system response by measuring the phase angle between the load cell and the LVDTs. If the phase angle is not within specified limits, you investigate the possibility of excessive friction at various points in the mechanical setup. Typical problems in the mechanical system include an oversized servo valve, too much friction in the actuator, and triaxial cell seals and misalignment caused by improper design or setup of the triaxial cell components. The last part of the overall system test is to check your triaxial pressure chamber to be sure it can maintain a series of prescribed pressure levels for 10 minutes each. After all these tests, you need to fill in the standardized report forms that are included in RD-96176. After you've completed all the verification procedures shown so far and your system is up and running, you should re-verify your system at least annually and also right after any repair or relocation of the test equipment. That's especially important for load cells. They're easily damaged and since there's only one in the test setup, it won't always be obvious when a load cell has been damaged. You should always have on hand a current calibration certificate for each load cell used in your lab. When you've gone through all of the electronics and system protocols, you go on to the third major part of the startup process, where you evaluate the proficiency of lab technicians in preparing samples and carrying out resilient modulus testing. Two kinds of samples are defined in FHWA protocol P46 for resilient modulus testing. Type 1 samples are coarse-grained material, and type 2 samples are fine-grained material. We won't go into the details of sample preparation here because another video in this series covers that in more detail. Instead, we'll just cover the acceptance criteria for technician proficiency. There are three of them, and you need to check all three for each type of sample. First, you need to maintain consistent pressure inside the triaxial test chamber. Second, you need to get consistent readings from each LVDT throughout the test. And finally, you need to get comparable data from the two LVDTs. If the outputs of the two LVDTs are not within specified limits of each other, it could be because one or both are stuck, or because there is misalignment in the triaxial cell. As you can see, the resilient modulus startup process is complex. To recap, you need to verify that your electronic system works right. You need to verify that your most critical system components and the system as a whole are performing properly. And you need to check the proficiency of the technicians who will perform the tests. When you've verified all that, you've accomplished a lot and you're ready for production testing, which is described in the next video in this series. But remember, your resilient modulus data is crucial to successful pavement design, so your data has to be accurate that's why you should test your equipment and your people against the startup protocols on a regular basis.